All right, so I'm in security world again, and we remember I was ta we talked to Scott Field before, so we're like back in the same building, 27. Who are you? You look familiar. So I'm uh, Jonathan Schwartz. Uh -huh. uh, did the previous Channel 9 stint on UAC. Ah. Uh, and I uh, guess was responsible for the architecture and the development of UAC as a whole for Vista. Excellent. What's happening? How you doing? I'm Chris Corio. I'm a program manager on UAC as well. Yep. This is my first official um, Channel 9 interview. Channel 9 stint. Well, we had your brother on here. <laughs> exactly. He hasn't been on yet. We haven't shown exactly. that one. <laughs> so, uh, yep. Very Just cool. Being... So, you said that you were responsible for the architecture and development of UAC. Now, let's be honest. UAC is one of these constructs that's taking a lot of heat mm -hmm. in the press. Uh, let's talk about to begin with the problem that you were trying to solve before we get into why you implemented it the way you did. Yeah. How about that? Sure thing. Um, so one of the things that we tend to do um, when we're kind of looking at our scenarios, our, our problem scenarios, is to split things into um, sort of enterprise issues uh, versus home consumer issues, mm -hmm. right? Because it's very different operating environments. Um, and so in the enterprise case, right, the problem was really just the, the TCO, the total cost of ownership of Windows. So we had, you know, we kind of like to run under the assumption that, you know, oh yeah, in the enterprise, in right, sort of this magic environment in the enterprise where, you know, 99% of the users, the desktop users, were, they were already running a standard user. And, you know, it's sort of the odd case that people have their desktop users configured to run as administrators. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is it's, it's kind of the opposite direction. It turns out about 90% of the enterprise customers that we have have their users running as administrators full-blown administrators, and maybe 10% have them running as standard users. And this, is, this ends up being just a massive, massive annual cost per desktop to the IT departments for the administration of these machines in the mm -hmm. enterprise. And so we've got clear, consistent feedback from our enterprise customers. You know, we need to be able to run our desktop users as standard users, and, and that includes mobile users too. So, you know, things like you take your laptop on the plane, you come off the plane three time zones away, and there's no way you could get the time to adjust, you know, on XP, for example, <laughs> unless you're an at all, unless you're an administrator, right? So, so your clock is always three hours off if you're running as a standard user. Not, not such a good thing. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the enterprise space right there. Okay. The consumer space, right? A lot of the issues are are very different, right? So consumer space, you have a whole lot of malware that uh, had a very, very easy install path onto machines, right? All these things that come on over, place rootkits down in the box, and you know, the user never has an idea that any of this is even going on or any ability to even stop it mm -hmm. um, simply because they're an admin all the time and it requires, you know, administrative privilege to go and install the rootkit. Um, you know, email attachments, things that you're pulling down off the web and running, mm -hmm. things that are you're sort of executing from, from starting from the least trusted environment possible are all of a sudden running with full privilege to wreck the entire machine at any point in time. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that in the consumer space, one of the interesting stats we got was that 33%, a full third of the PSS escalations that we had at home ended up with a resolution of reinstall the operating system. Right, so, so the machine was in such a <laughs> far gone state, there was so much who knows what that had been tweaked and automatically reconfigured or malicious software installed, right, web pop-ups all over, you know, especially in the days before a lot of the uh, you know, anti-spyware technologies that were out there, 33% of the time our customers are being told, yep, put in the disk, start over. And, and that's just, I mean, that's, that's awful, right? It's an absolutely horrible customer experience. Mm -hmm. and, and cost to the customer in, in time, in experience that they had to gain that they don't necessarily want mm -hmm. with respect to Windows. Um, also, the thing that we were hearing loudest as far as feature requests from our consumer space was for parental controls. Yeah. Right? A lot of parents not thrilled with the fact that, you know, their children, you know, their four or five, six-year-old children are running as full-blown administrators all the time, installing all the software they might want, browsing to all the different web pages that they may want and the parents may not want mm -hmm. um, and just you know complete inability for the parents to be able to control them to say no you're restricted to use the computer during certain hours or only play certain games during certain hours um, and you can't go to these websites at all period uh, and it's just for all intents and purposes it is impossible to apply parental controls to a user that is ultimately an administrator Right, because they always reserve the right to go and, and tweak those controls, just the mm -hmm. same as the parent. Um, so that was sort of the, the, the starting point, the very, very high level set of, of customer scenarios that we got. 
um, that factored into you know, what eventually became UAC in mm -hmm. Vista. So, I mean, and of course, we have to take some of the responsibility for people running as administrator because that's how it comes out of the box. You don't know any better. Mm -hmm. Now you could say, well, we teach people to always run as limited user, always run as limited user. The problem is developers are used to writing applications that target context running as administrator. And so their apps wouldn't work right mm -hmm. if you ran as limited user. I, yeah. think, and, uh, I think one of the key points was that prior to Windows Vista, we really hadn't tested our operating system and had every developer in Windows running our operating system as a standard user full time. And once you do that, everyone starts to use their component and go, oh, this doesn't work quite right, or this particular thing needs to be fixed. And no. you know, we went through Windows and fixed you know, countless bugs. We, we hate you, you broke our component. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we filled up a lot of, but uh, we yeah. hate you. Uh, <laughs> so even, yeah, even but, internally, people are mad at UAC. Well, huh? uh, That's good stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's, in, it's in, good in, stuff. Internally, it's good stuff. internally as much yeah. as externally, you've yeah. got you know, people who are raving and people who are loathing. Exactly. It's, it's, you know, and it's, it's one of those features because it is very public, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with respect to the customer and with respect to the press and with respect to reviews and... Yeah. You know, because it was refined over the course of the betas, mm -hmm. um, where a lot of people yeah. set expectation or not expectations, but set opinions that that kind of lasted through RTM. Mm -hmm. It's it's something that, uh, in in the cases of a lot of people, has kind of galvanized them in either direction. You know, it, and uh, one of the things, like a lot of people, really don't have a great understanding of security, and we see that even with some of our developers internally. And as we sort of start to explain to them why we've done this and what we've done, mm -hmm. a lot of times they're like, oh, "Okay, we get it," and that was enough. Sure. So sometimes. Yeah, that was that was all it took was just explaining kind of what we were doing. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, Chris, Chris also really hit the nail on the head with. I mean, basically, it's just, you know, so the t the example that we gave before with respect to setting the time, right? Mm -hmm. Setting the time for a mobile user, it was something that that Windows itself didn't let you do, and so you know, it's I, I know it's it's sort of it's convenient for us to be able to say, oh yeah, all those apps that are out there they need to be changed so that, you know, they work correctly as standard user. The, I mean, the truth is a lot of it started here at home, right? It's, sure. I mean, the, yeah. a, a large chunk of Windows Vista was spent re-engineering portions of the operating systems that, it, for the first time, they actually worked well as a standard user. And they actually worked consistently as a standard user. Exactly. And that, that was, I mean, it was a mountain of, of effort. I mean, it was across the entire product. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, and then you start from there, and then it's across Microsoft and across the industry. Yeah. Um, it, it's a huge, huge problem. Absolutely. Um, which, which is is now. I mean, so, sorry. So, so, <laughs> so no, no problem. That's I mean, good, man. to put it into perspective, uh, the first build of beta two, we flipped UAC on by default, and that was when the world was introduced to UAC. So, I mean, that that shows like the timeline. At that point, everyone logging on as an administrator was running their day to day activities with the, the privileges of a standard user, mm -hmm. and that's when. Starting in beta two, that first build, we saw everything kind of change, and everyone everyone kicked in, engaged. The experience obviously changed drastically from that that point to RTM. Mm -hmm. But that was, I mean, that was it. That was like the the reality. Like, okay, now we're running Windows as a standard user, and we got to sort it out. I mean, and, so, that, and that's the, that's the, an Uber point. I yeah. Mean, oh man, it's huge. You run as a yeah. standard user now, right? We've talked about this before about UAC. You run as a standard user. Here's the thing that is confusing people. From a, a user perspective, yep. Uh, with with the advent of SP2, people started f to think about security a little bit, right? Because IE yep. would prompt you, "Are you sure you want to do that? Are you <laughs> sure you want to install Active Access Control?" Exactly. So they started getting messaging. But with UAC, it's very dramatic messaging. Yes. And it's, sometimes it's confusing to people to know exactly what to do. True. Right. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. things freeze up, and you get this UI that says, "An application that you." might be the 30th time that you're using it, wants to do the same thing it did the last 29 times. Yep. So let's talk about that and why that really is a, a reasonable solution and it's not just something you guys just threw together. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so I mean that one that one was a tough call, as you can imagine, right? I mean, a lot of back and forth on it. Yep. And, you know, what we, what we ultimately decided was the, the, really at the very, very highest level, what we wanted to do was to move the world to move you know, Microsoft, the industry, everything to standard user. To actually having apps that are out there, having a system that is out there that is designed to run as the standard user, designed to provide functionality as a standard user. Um, and so, essentially, I guess what we ended up what we ended up doing was we basically said, if there is an application that that is saying, "Yep, I'm I'm an admin app." 
right? It, it is going to be a little more painful, a little more jarring to run that. Not because we want to inflict pain on the user. Obviously, that's a bad thing, mm -hmm. right? But we want to make it very clear to the user. You know, it's like, look, you were you were a whole lot safer, you know, yes. until you until you were about to go hit OK. And mm -hmm. just so you know, you know, what you're about to do is putting you into a mode where you could be making machine wide changes. You could be, you know, installing software affecting other users on the machine, yep. mm -hmm. right? And it's it's sort of a, a fundamental. Um, I'll say it's a mode change almost from one side of that dialogue to the other. Um, and at the same time, we also didn't want to do, you know, something to the effect of uh, caching the results of that elevation, right? Basically saying, yep, don't 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 ever remind me about this one again. Um, for several reasons. The first one is, right, we'd rather ask the question sort of one step back from that, which is, if you're being prompted multiple times to do a certain task or over and over for the same piece of system functionality for the same application, mm -hmm. right, we would much rather take a very hard look at that application and say, why is this thing prompting at all? Absolutely. Right? Is this a piece of functionality that should be moved per user? Right? So I'll give an example of this. When the first kind of series of beta 2 builds went out, I think even when beta 2 was released, Chris right. will probably remember for sure, um, the changing the display properties, right, changing your screen right. resolution, your themes, that was actually marked as an admin operation. Right? You needed to elevate in order to go change your display resolution. I well, remember that. Yeah, display, and I'm sure a lot of people in the beta we program reminded. remember that too. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, that one, that one, yeah. that one slipped through. No question. Right? I mean, it's, that one slipped through and got a lot of loud feedback about it. And that's that's a case where it's it's pretty blatantly obvious. You know what? Mm -hmm. It's the screen resolution. That's how the computer looks to me when I log on. Yes. Right? The the themes, the backgrounds, the colors, my fonts, that's that's a personal preference. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that affects any other user. It's not something that should affect any other right. user. That's something that should not require an elevation prompt. Right? And and Sure enough, as soon as we realized that that one had sort of slipped through as was, it became something that did not require an elevation prompt. Okay. Um, so actually, that I guess that being said, um, if there are folks out there that are running into things that really ought not to be admin operations, or they're getting prompted repetitively for operations that they do day to day, mm -hmm. then please, by all means, let us know. Um, yeah. You send me an email. Yeah. Spare John's time, but well, why, not, why not hook into the why not hook into the Windows Diagnostic Infrastructure and have a counter that says so we do okay we, we do actually yeah. Aha, thought of that right. um, in fact really? that was how yeah. we that was how we prioritized a lot of the work uh -huh. <laughs> that was how we prioritized a lot of the work starting with um, starting with the beta two builds um, so it's uh, essentially Squim is the underlying technology that we use to, mm -hmm. to get sort of messaging back, especially from the beta programs. Mm -hmm. In RTM, you can opt in to sending information back. Mm -hmm. um, we love it when you do because then we actually have real customer data to use for basing decisions. Um, but that was how we basically took a look and we saw, we said, you know what? This spot right here, this is the top elevation. And it's 30% of the time that people are elevating, it's for you know, this executable right here. This is priority number one. Mm -hmm. Right, and so that was how we were able to actually go and target. Um, we also had a number of other metrics that we used as basic ship criteria, right? So scenarios meeting the expectation with respect to elevation, right? Should mm -hmm. it require elevation to install a piece of software that is for all users, right? Okay, yes. Should it require an elevation that is only going to be for me for a piece of per user software? Obviously, no. Mm -hmm. Right. So we had a whole, we had a few hundred of uh, hundred of a few hundred scenarios. Mm -hmm. There we go. In that, mm -hmm. in that list that we actually were checking constantly. Another thing we looked at is you know, how many uh, no prompt sessions, as we call them, essentially the start of a log on to your log off. You know, what percentage of those have no prompts whatsoever? And our ship criteria was 65%. And by the time we shipped, it was up at about 70. Um, so from the first batch of RTM that we're at now, it's actually at about 45%. Mm -hmm. And it's not surprising because all the spots where we're seeing people elevate, Right, the top top uh, hits right now are for you know things like uh, admin file operations, right? installers, application installers, yeah. device management, device properties, computer management. Essentially, that initial configuration and application installation phase. Mm -hmm. right? And so the expectation when we shipped Vista, the expectation of how things would work is that people would hit the kind of installation and configuration phase. Mm -hmm. That would be when they would get their prompts, and then after that you should be seeing prompts rarely, if ever. Um, and, you know, again, if that is not the case with your current experience, we definitely would like to know about it. And we'll, 
you know what, we'll get um, an official link or alias or whatever that we'll put up alongside the, the post. Yeah. Um, so that it definitely makes, make sure it definitely gets to the right people. Mm -hmm. Because that's, right, and that's how we know, you know, like, oh, we missed this scenario, right? Or, you know what, more people are hitting this than we expected based on the beta feedback that we got mm -hmm. or what we saw people doing during the beta. Um, and so, so yeah, that is definitely where we could use your assistance to make sure that things keep getting better and better, mm -hmm. um, and and that you know Windows moving forward really just continues to shine for a standard user. So I mean, I, I've noticed a lot of variation between people who get these prompts a lot to the point where they unfortunately turn it off, mm -hmm. um, and people like me who I hardly ever get these prompts when I'm doing my day-to-day -day work, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about what invokes the prompt. Clearly, the application writer is going to say, I need elevated privileges. Mm -hmm. So the system goes, OK, and then tells the user. But what if the application doesn't uh, have code that says, I, want, I require elevation? It just breaks, right? Let's talk, about, let's talk about how that works. OK. So yeah, one of the, one of the biggest fears when, when we actually pitched UAC upwards Mm -hmm. Right, and this was from from the exec level. Actually, I think even Bill expressed concern over this at one point. Was app compat, mm -hmm. right? So, so we we started with Windows 3.1. Right? We sort of moved to Windows 95, the whole Win 9x family, right, as we tend to call it. Um, and then you sort of had this merging point at Windows XP. And because of, to a large degree, because of compatibility, because you were dealing with this immense application infrastructure mm -hmm. that had always run with the assumption that you know. On Windows 95, there is one user, and that user owns the entire machine. Right? The default user type on Windows XP was set to administrator. And right, as time went on, it's been basically five years since Windows XP shipped, and all the software that has come out since then, uh, more or less, right, it, it, is a, it was a very valid business decision for somebody to say, you know, we could spend extra time making things really work for a standard user, and 1% of the Windows users out there will actually be trying to run it in that state. Right? Or, you know, if you were lucky, they could put up a dialogue that basically said, sorry, you can't run me as a standard user. Right? If you were unlucky, they failed, crashed, fell over in, in all kinds of interesting ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so... <laughs> Let me interject here. Yeah, go for it. I think, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I think the other thing is that the, leg the historic legacy of Windows was that our developers ran as admins. Yep. They developed oh, as yeah, admins. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, even the people just writing simple scripts and simple applications, mm -hmm. they they weren't testing a standard user. And that that was, like I said, that was like our biggest thing. When we turned Windows on as a standard user, it changed how everyone looked at their code. Okay. And and I think that's like a big thing that we see going through the, the ecosystem. Absolutely. Right now. Exactly. Yeah. And it's I like, didn't mean to derail. Oh, no, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, right on, it's right on target. And yeah. I mean, like, like we were saying before, it would be convenient to kind of point the finger at everybody and else and essentially say, oh, see, yeah, they, they made the decision to run yeah. their stuff as admin. But, you know, it's, I mean, XP kind of fused together from a Win9x model. And right. so, you know, we, we certainly played our part in helping that trend along. And, exactly. and it was kind of our, our job, our I mean, responsibility from those of us working inside the security organization right, to kind of reverse that trend. Um, and so, yeah, like Chris said, we, we flipped the switch, and I think approximately 50% or so of the Windows applications pretty much just failed to work. Of the okay. applications we of, tested. Of the applications that we tested, yeah, as, <laughs> as a random sample. Yeah, sure. Um, exactly. So, yeah, so one of the things that we did do um, was we had data, you know, previous data that basically said, you know what, the bulk, the, the kind of, the, the bulk of the application issues that are out there involve applications writing to admin-only registry locations and admin-only file system locations. And, and so that, for that one, we sort of applied a, a big hammer that we, we call virtualization. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not to be confused with, uh, I guess, as, as, it's more as the term is more commonly used in the industry to refer to you know, isolation or virtual machines, this was kind of more along the lines of file and registry redirection. So actually, if I remember, I will call it file and registry redirection for the for the duration of the okay. of the video. If I remember, sure. if not, Chris will hit me with his phone or something. Okay, right on. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> essentially, what that does is inside the system um, for applications that we know are not Vista aware, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, essentially, we have code inside the registry and code in a file system filter driver that is watching for these failed operations to certain locations. Right, so in the registry, it's under HK Local Machine software, 
right, where a lot of applications store their data or register things. And in the file system, it's under program files, the Windows directory, I think Windows System 32, maybe a smattering of other spots. Okay. And what ends up happening is if the application attempts a write there and the write fails and it's due to access denied and it's a write that would have worked for an administrator, mm -hmm. um, the redirection code actually goes and redoes that write in a per user location. And then the next time you actually go and try to read that value, you get redirected to the per user value instead. Um, right, so it's kind of a you know try attempt and redirect under the covers. Um, and this actually bumped up the app compat rate from roughly 50% to I think about 75, 78%, yeah, high 70s, yeah. And so at that point we were basically left with you know all the other applications that were, that were out there and you know we looked for more generic solutions where we could. Mm -hmm. So a good example of one like this legacy application that um, you know you elevate it and it installs shortcuts, start menu shortcuts, desktop icons, all of that fun stuff but it installs it only for the installing user, mm -hmm. right? So it puts it under HKEY current user. Um, and, you know, the problem is we have this mode where standard user initiates an elevated, re uh, elevated action and it gets prompted for credentials by an admin. We call that sort of the over-the-shoulder elevation. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the elevated user isn't the same as the user who is sort of really initiating the install. And so as a result, you know, standard user starts installing a game, the game falls into this pattern, you know, puts the uh, shortcuts under the, the elevated user's HKEY current user, and as a result the game is installed and the standard user can't find the links and has no way to actually yeah. go and start the game. <laughs> um, and so, you know, for that we, we ended up putting in an AppCompat shim that, you know, watches for those inside of installers and redirects them into every user's profile so that they, they kind of show up for all users rather than just, you know, the elevated user. Okay. Um, and so, ultimately, we did have to go in and, and individually debug and apply application-level shims to a large number of applications. Um, I lost track after the yeah. first thousand. So, or so. Yeah, <laughs> if you had any idea how many uh, apps this guy has gone through, it, it's absolutely <laughs> astounding. <laughs> but uh, um, I think, like, the, really, what we're we're showing here is that the legacy applications and app compat in general was one of the biggest hurdles that we had to attack when we were doing this yeah and um, and did you maybe you wanted to explain installer detection yeah I, I was, don't know you probably gonna, gonna go well, there. That bring, that'll bring you why don't you go for it yeah so um, so basically John described a lot of the, the the fixes we made for runtime of applications where we saw them writing into places where they didn't have privilege and more than likely that was just because before they were developed you know, very, quite simply as admins and assumed they had rights. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other issues we saw that, that was fairly dramatic within the application pool was that uh, installers, things named like setup.exe or, uh, or updaters that similarly, excuse me, similarly updated binaries just tried to, to write, ex write to uh, program files. You know, just first thing they do is fire up a uh, process and start writing binaries straight to program files, registry keys, and HKLM, everything that would fail, all right, because most installers are machine-wide things and so mm -hmm. on. So what we did was we cr created a set of hu heuristics, um, name of the file being set up, uh, containing setup, containing install. We did this for multiple languages. Uh, exactly. So I, I don't know what installer is in Korean, but John probably does, and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's in there probably. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, basically, what what we did was we created this technology mm -hmm. um, where our installers would, and and that is actually a little bit different than than the runtime because that will actually generate a UAC prompt. Mm -hmm. So that's where we say this particular executable that you're about to start mm -hmm. requires administrator privilege and. Um, we would only prompt you if it actually didn't have a manifest in it that said it didn't require admin. So again, it's a legacy technology. Mm -hmm. And we'll prompt the user and say, hey, we think this is an installer. It's assigned by this, and we give you all the UAC uh, information. And then we would, would uh, execute it if you were to hit accept or provide admin credentials. Excellent. So that's kind of so with your with respect to your initial question, I'm sure there's a, probably a couple of things I may be missing. What was my initial but question? Again? Your initial question was why? <laughs> forgive me. Why might some users see more? Uh, yes. More prompts, mm -hmm. and the case is that in some of these some of these situations where we have legacy apps mm -hmm. that that maybe trigger installer detection or their updaters aren't quite ready for Vista yet, um, you're seeing some cases where people use these 
these applications and they cause elevations. Mm-hmm. Um, and some people probably are a little more vocal than others. It's probably oh, <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> yeah. And I certainly experienced plenty of that. I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the point there is that um, in these cases where we haven't found the, inst- the updaters and some of them we fixed, some of them we've marked, um, that's a fair thing to let us know about and we'll follow up with the ISVs, we'll see what we can do internally to fix them and so on. And, and we've gone further in Windows Vista now you can use MSI and MSI's patching technology called MSPs mm-hmm. that will provide you a means for doing uh, patching without elevating um, through through the UAC experience. Cool. So, um, yeah, there's plenty of documentation on that and stuff. Well, that's good. I mean, because there is a developer story to UAC. We definitely want to touch on that today. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Absolutely. I have an article in MSDN Magazine. If, uh, well, we're going to link to it right here. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be a point. There. <laughs> I had to do it. No, that's important. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look, let's be honest. There's a lot of misperception, even at Microsoft, with yep. all the incredibly yep. smart people we have. I've been on long threads mm-hmm. with very intelligent people yep. that are quite, you know, some of them get it. Some are like, well, I never get prompted for elevation. What are you doing? <laughs> like, why are all these people doing so many administrative tasks? I don't get prompted. Absolutely. What's going on? Yeah. Let's see. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. And then somebody will come by and with a very and be like, all I'm doing is running this application and I get prompted every single time. Exactly. And everyone's like, that application shouldn't prompt for administrative rights. Exactly. Who wrote the app? You know that, which is what you just talked yeah. about. And I'm sorry that I'm keeping shining. See, that's the problem. With only have one camera. So <laughs> I right. blather on. People look like kind of like a drool starts <laughs> coming out of their mouths. Like, Oh. But yeah, so. I mean, that's, and, and also, I mean, like like Chris was saying, you know, it's uh, for for all the applications that we looked at, you know, mm-hmm. ones that generated prompts when when they should not have, mm-hmm. um, we looked at as just as serious as you know the application doesn't work. It, it was in the same category as far as an application bug was concerned, yep, cool. and you know we went through and. You know, there were some cases, so give you the most extreme example, something like a lot of the MMORPGs out there. Um, you know, a lot of these things, they go, they connect up to the server every time you log on, right? And they suck down updates every time you log on. Mm-hmm. And it could be binaries, could be data, but they store it all under the app directory, which is admin protected. Um, and we actually, we don't do file redirection on executable, basically PE binaries, things like .exe, .dll. Right. Very simple check there, but the reason for that is because we know that you know, all of these people whose apps are now getting virtualized, you know, all of these ISVs, rather, whose apps are getting virtualized, well, they're going to want to release a new version and probably be able to update from the previous version. Mm-hmm. And if they have 18 copies of their executables on the machine because there were 18 users that all pulled down different copies that got bounced all over, they're never going to be able to update that. You'll have data out of sync with the executables. It'll just be a nightmare. So we did try to limit the scope of that redirection as much as possible. So in a case like that, right, the MMORPGs, every time you log, every time you log on, you're getting updates, and so that could mean, you know, hey, we mark it as an admin app, right? You get prompted for elevation every time, and that's uh, that's just a horrendous experience, mm-hmm. and it's it's also horrendous when you consider the target market for a lot of those are also the people that you probably want to make a standard user on the machine, right, or have under parental controls. Right. And so in some cases like that, you know, we actually had to go and open up the ACL on the directory so that any user could pull down updates for the application. Um, in other cases, you know, the installer detection heuristics that Chris mentioned, you know, they caught some unintentional, uh, unintentional folks that, you know, I don't know, let's say for example an application that every time it launches it starts something called check for updates.exe. Mm-hmm. Right, well, it contains the sort of magic update word in there. It makes it sound like an updater, like it needs to, you know, actually mm-hmm. elevate to do its job. All it's really doing is checking for updates. Mm-hmm. And if they're there, then it's going to launch the real updater. Mm-hmm. And so that was a case where we could go in, look at how the app was actually behaving, mark that exe as not requiring elevation, and you know, lo and behold, the prompts disappeared. Now, that being said, right, there are a lot of applications out there, and we were only able to tinker with the ones that we saw or were, were reported to us through the beta program that we had in the app library that we have here, you know, but it certainly doesn't mean that we caught all of them. So like Chris said, we definitely want to hear about others that you know, are, are giving bad experiences where we can talk to the ISV, maybe get things working really well for a standard user, right? who knows, um, but certainly not, not dump the burden on the poor person who's running this application and getting hit with prompts for it every time when there's no reason for it. Okay, so now let's, let's shift gears a little bit mm-hmm. because I think, like always, misperception is born from misunderstanding and ignorance. Ignorance just meaning not having the sufficient knowledge to understand what's going on. 
That's all I mean. Yeah. Not using it as in a mean way. <laughs> so let's, you know, maybe go to the whiteboard or whatever, however you want to do it, and let's talk about how UAC works. Let's sure. talk about, and you know, Students. you're talking to engineers here. You're <laughs> yep. talking to engineers, yeah. you're talking to technical people, but do it in such a way that, you know, pretty much anyone will be able to understand, but assume sure. that people understand how, you know, things work in a software architecture world. Yep. How's that? Sure. Move around. Sounds fair. Yeah, it's a little bit. You can stay there. I'll just, I'll just kind of do this. Okay. So wherever you're comfortable. Well, I'm, the yeah. one that's leaning? Yeah. Nice. Okay. So, easiest thing is probably just to, look at that, picking it up and everything. Remember, this is serious business. So, I guess the easiest thing is to, is to start off by taking a look at how things work in XP. Right, so right yeah. here we're, we're sort of running as the user in the user's session, um, mm -hmm. and essentially what happens is, right, let's pick, let's pick the shell, and explorer.exe. And so okay. you go and you, you double click on an application or on, you know, a file that has an actual registered file extension. Mm -hmm. Ultimately what happens is, explorer.exe calls the shell execute API or potentially shell execute ex, right? Shell execute goes on down, it calls create process, and create process, right, under the covers, calls down into the kernel, creates process structure, everything gets populated, app gets launched. Okay. Right? And so typically, right, if you're on XP, mm -hmm. Explorer is running as an admin, so all of this happens as an admin, the new process launches, as an admin. Okay. Okay. So, as far as the basic process creation path is concerned, um, right, for if you're a standard user launching a process, none of that changed on Vista. What did change, though, is this case where you're running as a standard user, and you need to launch something that requires elevation. Right. So the first thing we had to do was basically say, well, okay, somehow in this in this mix of things, we need to figure out, you know, what this executable requires more permission than the current user has, right? Actually requires elevation. Okay. And so there are actually three checks that happen inside of create process. Um, the first one is app compat. Right. And so app compat actually ends up covering um, applications that have been specifically marked, legacy applications that have been specifically marked as admin applications. And on top of that, the, the bulk of the heuristic checks that Chris mentioned before. Okay. So things that are based on name matching, file description mapping, um, just various things like that out of the, the actual executables, different fields. So the next thing that happens is a check with Fusion. Hmm. And so most people are probably familiar with Fusion as, and Fusion manifests uh, in the side-by-side -side context. Things that let you say in your application, you know, yes, I need to use version 7 of the CRT, or I need to use version 5 of the common controls. Right? And as a result, you know, Windows will make sure that whenever your application launches, you get that version of the DLL. Mm. So what we actually did for UAC and Vista is we extended that manifest schema. We added a new field in there that lets you basically say, you know, hi, I'm an application that requires elevation. Right? Or I'm an application that can run in the context of whomever called me. Right, and so the actual term in the manifest for the first one is require administrator, for the second it's as invoker, um, and there are one or two other tweaks that you can make in there as well. Um, and so I know I mentioned before as well that you know we would come back to how we determine that an application is, I'll say, Vista aware um, mm. with respect to UAC. If it contains a Fusion manifest, and that Fusion manifest has this new metadata in there, well then we know it was built to run on Vista with UAC in mind. Um, and in that case, we can do things like turn off virtualization and uh, other stuff that we know, kind of, you know, assistance that legacy applications need that this application won't. Excellent. So, anyhow, after we check Fusion, um, assuming we still have not gotten a hit that says, yes, this is an admin application, we check other, and I'll just call them installer heuristics. And these are typically things that target um, kind of broad scale uh, a bunch of different categories of legacy installers. Mm -hmm. So there are legacy installers out there that you know always stamp the executables that they generate, or legacy installer packages that stamp the executables they generate with a, a well-known, well-named manifest. Right? And so we can look for that manifest name. 
um, there are certain unpackers uh, that when you actually go and use them, either they stamp it with a specific manifest or they have specific kind of byte patterns inside of them that we can match against at well-known points inside of the executable. And so we know if those are there, it falls into this category. So it kind of gets, you know, smaller and smaller hit rate, more and more obscure as you go, but they, those still do catch a, a large quantity of uh, legacy installers that are out there. Excellent. So let's assume that none of these have generated a hit. Right? Okay. So everything goes through, and, and for some reason or another, we basically say, yes, this is a non-admin application. Then it works exactly the same as XP. Application gets launched as the user on the user's desktop. Done deal. Okay. So when things get more interesting is when any of these three return a hit. When they say, yep, this is, this is admin code. This thing requires elevation to run. So at that point, what we do is we return a new error from create process. And it's error elevation required. What's the hex for that? Just a uh, it's 740 decimal. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> you can do the math. <laughs> so anyway, um, and that, that actually comes back from create process. And the reason we actually did that instead of saying, oh no, create process itself is going to deal with the elevation mm -hmm. is because right, we're talking about an elevation that involves UI. And create process, right, create process is a very low level API. Uh, it's an API that's been around for a long, long time, has a very rich AppCompat legacy, mm -hmm. right, and has never, ever expressed to its callers, right, it's never been a requirement to the callers, hey, that, you know, this thing could put up UI, right, it doesn't take an HWIND, it doesn't even know what an HWIND is. Create process, it's just, it's not a spot that could support that kind of uh, UI plumbing. Absolutely. So, shell execute, on the other hand, right, has always taken an HWIND. It has always been an expectation that a shell execute call could take a long time. It could put up a prompt that requires user feedback. Um, and so we basically just continued that. And shell execute contains logic that checks for and knows how to handle error elevation required. Okay. So what happens at that point is we end up calling across. And I'll draw this line here. So we call across from the user's session okay. into the system session, right? Or session zero, or the system space, however you want to refer to it. Okay. And this goes across to a new service that we wrote for Vista. Or, well, we, we abbreviate it as app info. The full name is, or the service name is app info. The full name, the display name, it's the application information service. Um, or just, actually, it's just technically application information. Okay. Um, so, this is a DLL. It's hosted inside of one of the instances of service host on the machine. Um, and you know, as the column implies, it, it is running as system. Okay. So the first thing that app info does, right, because shell execute has passed across, it's passed across all of this information, right, from an untrusted source. You know, hey, this is the app. Yes, I promise it really does require elevation, mm -hmm. but app info can't trust any of these inputs, you know, carte blanche. So the first thing it does is it actually reruns these elevation checks. Right? Okay. It basically says, let me, let me just really double check. And on top of that, I'm going to make sure that I know who's making the call that this requires elevation. Right? Because if it's coming from, I don't know, let's say, you know, coming from Fusion or coming from AppCompat, we may want to take slightly different behavior. Right? So like I mentioned, turning off virtualization, although that is in the, the standard user case, but things along those lines. Okay. Um, so once app info decides, yes, this really is an app that requires elevation, mm -hmm. you know, I really do need to, to ask the user about this and make sure that it is either okay or that you know, we have an admin who can okay the operation, it goes, uh, I guess this is sort of hard to draw with two-dimensional board, but let's just say uh, yeah. This is the secure desktop. Okay, which now, runs in a different session. Uh, or different sort of. So technically okay. speaking, right, so the session is at the very, very top of the hierarchy mm. with respect to, to logons and, and sort of the, the user space. Okay. Um, session zero is where the services run. Sessions above that are where you know, the, each one gets created for a user logon. Within a session, there are these things called window stations. Underneath the window stations are things called desktops. Okay. So technically speaking, the secure desktop is actually Windows Station 0, WAC, 
win logon. That's sort of the, this is the window station name, this is the desktop name, but technically it is part of the same session okay. that in which this user is running. This user is running on the user desktop, it's wins to zero whack default, um, and obviously the ACL on those two desktop, the ACLs are very, very different. Okay. Right, so Which will prevent something like a shatter attack or something like that, right? Um, well, the fact that it's a completely different desktop actually yeah. makes it uh, makes the shatter attack not even an issue. Not, not yeah, not possible to execute is is <laughs> kind of the best way to put it. Um, and so yeah, I noticed that uh, folks had had keyed into that on on one of the uh, the yeah. entries on channel nine, uh -huh. and that was yeah, dead on. Absolutely dead on. Excellent. You mean you read Channel 9? I do read Channel hey, 9. Hey, you hear that, people? I read Channel this 9. This guy architected UAC, man. He's on Channel 9. I know Chris is as well. Absolutely. So, I read that all right. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. No, you're just kidding. <laughs> no. All right, you're done, man. No, He's got kidding, more man. views than you. Chris, Chris yeah, cut off. I'm just playing. Right, Chris, off. we got to cut I'm off. Cut off. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the, the ACL on the secure desktop actually only allows access to system. Mm -hmm. So even if a user process decided, you know what, I can't send Windows messages, I, I just sort of want to go and open the Windows station and throw my own application on there, and then I'll let that, you know, uh, send things across. It, it can't even open the ACL on the secure desktop. So that's system only. Okay. So what AppInfo ends up doing is it ends up launching consent.exe, um, which we frequently kind of call the, the consent UI, but this is actually the process that loads up. It's called credui.dll, and that's what puts up either the consent prompt or the cred prompt. Now, let me ask you, since we're on the, the this and that prompt, mm -hmm. what's the difference between, because sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes I see allow this exe to run, mm -hmm. Sometimes I see the administrator prompt, mm -hmm. that's, then I get, where I actually get a, a desktop, things black out, so I get to the secure desktop stage. Yep. But the allow is a different construct. Yes. Yes. So there are there are multiple. But is flavors. it part of your world? <clears throat> um, so if it's on the secure desktop and it's for UAC, then yes. Okay. So, but allow could just nest, could just be a typical Windows construct for security. So if I double click on exe, mm -hmm. sometimes I get this prompt, and I've talked to people about this as well. That says. Allow this to run. It's like the, the mark of the web. Oh, it could be the mark of the web. Okay. Uh, yeah, there. Fair enough. I just want to just confuse yeah. you because people might yes. lump that in with UAC. No, no, and, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. it's it's fair. We we mm. actually have seen a lot of that where, uh, I don't know. Let's say you do some file operations through the shell, right? This is some feedback that we've actually gotten back already from RTM. Mm -hmm. You do a file operation involving an, an admin-only file through the shell, and maybe the shell will ask you a couple of questions that basically, you know, oh, hey, this file name's really, really, really long. You know, you might not be able to recover it from the recycle bin when you're done. You sure you want to go ahead with delete? You say, well, yeah, okay. It's, well, you know, you have multiple files selected in different folders. You know, is, is that okay? You know, it's, yeah, that's okay. And then you get one that basically says, oh, hey, you don't have access to delete these? Do you want us to, to try harder? You're like, yeah, try harder. And then you get the UAC prompt. Right? <laughs> so we get feedback. We get, gee, we got these four stinking UAC prompts in a row to go and delete the file. And it's, you know, it's, yes, technically speaking, it's only one UAC prompt, but multiple prompts in a row, mm -hmm. that's not good either. So coming back to the theme from before, if you're hitting scenarios like that, we want to know about those as well. Okay. Because we want to make sure that those prompts are collapsed as much as possible. Excellent. Um, okay. Right. There's no reason the user should necessarily need to have to say yes to this, more to effectively what seems like the same question multiple times in a row. And again, to be clear. Yes. And I mean, you guys will agree with this. Your goal is not to prompt the hell out of people. In fact, it's the opposite. Correct. You prefer Absolutely. there to be no UAC prompts in somebody's yep. entire session. Agreed. But in fact, that's not the case yet. Very true. Just so want to make that clear to people that that. The prompts are not the feature. <laughs> the feature is protecting you from what can happen when you when you say, "I don't care. Go ahead, run it." Correct. Okay. And then the right the overall the larger feature is just moving everything towards standard. running as a standard user. It's awesome. Um, and running well. Power to the standard user. user. That's right. Exactly. Okay. So, yeah. Sometimes you will get the consent prompt. Sometimes you will get the credential prompt. Now, the reason I say sometimes is if you are a member of the administrators group. By default, you will get the consent prompt. If you are a standard user, 
who needs an admin to come on over, enter credentials to do the elevation, mm. by default you will get the credential prompt. Absolutely. So I say by default because both have policy widgets that you can tweak inside of the security policy editor. You could say, I, you know what, I always want members of the administrators group to get a credential prompt. Right? So there are cases, for example, in an enterprise where you know, maybe there are multiple admins that can actually come and get the job done. Maybe, you know, maybe one admin has access to a machine and another one doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so you might not always want to elevate to yourself, so to speak. You might not always want you know, your own elevated token running. Um, in the case of the credential prompt, right, we have a policy switch where you could say, you know what, standard users, they, they don't get a prompt at all. They just get an access denied. And the reason for that is because right, we got a lot of corporate feedback when we started doing a lot of the, the mm -hmm. legwork for the design that basically said, I love being able to run my desktops as a standard user. I do not want people calling help desk every time they get one of these prompts and basically saying, you know, what do I type? Right? And exactly. had, right? Just to be told, you don't. Yeah. Right? So, so we said, you know what, that is no problem. Access denied immediately. Uh -huh. right? And it just lets the user know in that case, ah, this is something that you I can't, can't do. Okay, and they move on. Um, and on top of that, each one of these dialogues actually has, uh, I guess, technically four variants. Mm -hmm. So the first variant um, is it's sort of a, a blue-green title bar across the top. Okay. And uh, the reason it's blue-green is that that just happens to be the Windows colors, and that's reserved for Windows OS executables um, that are basically that, that we expect users to need or want to run elevated. So for example, if you do right click and run elevated on command.exe, mm -hmm. right, we know people will want to launch an elevated command window. You should see a blue green tile on the top or rather title bar on the top. If you right click, do run elevated on Internet Explorer, and we don't want people doing that. Right? Yeah. We discourage that. <laughs> you're not going to get the blue green, you're going to get a, a much scarier piece of UI. Sure. So. The, the next one after that is a gray title bar. And the gray title bar means this executable is signed. Right? We can actually vouch for the information that we're displaying in the prompt. Okay. Right? Because remember, a signature it guarantees the identity. And on top of that, right, more importantly from this standpoint, it guarantees that the actual bits that comprise the executable have not been modified since the publisher signed the executable. And if we actually want to go and pull data out of that exe, to display to the user to help make a, a more informed and more guided decision, mm -hmm. we need to know that you know we're not pulling data out of some unsigned executable that a piece of malware could have just gone and pumped in whatever string it wants you to see. Okay. Right? We know that that's the string that the publisher really put in there. Okay. Um, and so that will actually apply to anything that is non-Windows that is signed. Mm -hmm. So that I mean that even applies to other Microsoft applications that are not the operating system. Okay. So the next one that you see is either the orange or yellow, um, depending on how you describe the color dialog. And that one looks scarier. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the case when you're launching an unsigned executable elevated. Right? And so in that case, you get sort of the raw file name. And you know, in the details, you get the raw file path. Because we don't, right, it's not signed. We can't trust any of the data that's in there. We don't mm -hmm. know if it's what was in there when the XE was actually published, when it landed on your machine even. Um, and on top of that, you know, it's, you'll, you'll notice the wording is a little bit firmer in there. It says, you know, Windows can't determine you know, who wrote this, what it is, what it might do. If you know and, and you, know, you feel okay with it, then go for it. Sure. I mean, that, that's sort of a, it's a dramatically different experience. Yeah. Because, I mean, sure. there's actually, as opposed to, what is it, the allow cancel uh, buttons, you now have lengthy descriptions saying, are you mm -hmm. sure you want to do this? And, I mean, it, it's meant to be a dramatic experience for our users. And, we, and I would just interject uh, so that people uh, who might not understand how execution works mm -hmm. on an operating system, it's virtually impossible for us to understand programmatically what an EXE is going to do. Oh man. Not at we this have point, no yeah. idea. At this point it's Correct. really difficult to Windows. do. And yep. So really all we're doing is say, hey, we don't know what this is going to do and if we could figure it out for you we would, but yep. it's hard to figure out what binary code is going to do. And, but all the code yeah. paths are going to be. And yep. I mean, on top of that, you're basically saying, we don't know where this was from. We don't have any reputation of the perhaps a vendor that, that you would see in a gray bar or in the green bar, which we say was us. Mm -hmm. we, just, we are trying to make it dramatic to say, this could put your machine at risk. And, and <laughs> I don't know. It's true. I, just be very, I can't stress 
yeah. how careful you should be when you click on one of those. Uh, yeah, and, and of course, if it comes up out of nowhere, and it's exactly. not due to an action you initiated, yeah. run. Right? I mean, can't run. cancel out of that. <laughs> now, um, you know what I have to say, though? That, that, that occasionally may happen. For mm -hmm. example, something on the system might want to do something. Like, let's say, like, I think I've seen um, random things pop up that say some process is requiring elevation, but it looks to be a system process. Hmm. Do you think that that's a bad thing? Send, that's probably send, bad design. Send us mail when you hit it. Okay. We will file a bug. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah. I, that, it, that's it, cool. It should never, it should always be, right, the, the, the kind of UX guidelines that we established around it, and uh -huh. then, uh, you know, we put obviously a lot of thought and effort into. Of course. Is that the user should always know it's coming. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's why you see all the shielded links in the various spots so that you know this is something that's going to require elevation. Excellent. Right? And so if it's coming out of nowhere, yeah. that's mm -hmm. bad. If it's coming out of nowhere and it's from the system, that's really, really <laughs> bad. Please let us know. Yes. Okay. So, but that's good that yeah. I, I mean, you know, whether or not that would, that really happened, you know, maybe I was hallucinating. But uh, it's good that we talked about this because let us know. Yes, right? definitely. Let you know. Definitely. Like send Chris an email. Send me an email. Send him an email. <laughs> I'm going to put your email address That's on fine. the post. That's fine. Is it? Yeah. I, my email How about your cell number? <laughs> cell number? We'll save the cell number. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So this is this is nice. I mean, I want to, again, back up here and get the full okay. picture here okay. oh, so that people then, can see it. Yeah, just sort of for a complete list. Completeness. completeness like, yeah. Completeness. Last but not least. Of course. Um, it is possible, though extremely unlikely, to see a dialog that has a red title bar. And in that case, you don't even get the option of running it or not. This is one that we know is signed by um, a publisher that is untrustworthy. Mm. Right? So just for example, we know that there are, um, for example, right in the past, there have been cases of Microsoft keys that were leaked. Mm -hmm. And they were immediately placed into the untrusted publishers list. Okay. Right? And, and so your system ships with them as untrusted publishers. So somebody can't go and try to pass off their own code as Microsoft signed, right? And so if you come across an XE that you're trying to run elevated and it has that one of those certificates on it, you'll get a red dialog. You don't even get the choice to run it. Excellent. So at the end now of the Now let me ask you this. Yep. This is an interesting question. Okay. If you know, I mean, theoretically, if I'm running IE, for example, and malware, there's say there's a flaw in the, in the JScript engine, mm -hmm. just per, perhaps, and an XE just it just gets onto my machine and starts then launches. You guys catch that and let me know. Why not always have a red bar? Because would that break the whole ActiveX? What I'm trying to ask you is, if I go to a web page and it tries to install malware on my machine, mm -hmm. um, that operation of an EXE trying to run where I had absolutely nothing to do with it, wouldn't that automatically also be a red bar? Uh, well, so remember that is not necessarily going to go through the elevation path. Okay. So uh, that exact scenario is why the IE team for IE7 on Vista put a lot of work into things like protected mode IE. It's why you get you know the gold bar if you get to a page and it's trying to you know download something or run something. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, maybe a talk with I'm assuming the IE team. Done a talk with the I IE have, team. but I, yeah. I, it's a good point. I mean, it makes perfect sense. You're running in protected mode, and IE is going to protect you the best they can. I, yeah. I got that. You guys yeah. can't solve all the problems, um, but that would be interesting. Yep. You know. Absolutely. Cool. I think one of the points is like we're always interested in how apps get are deployed, how our users get apps, and so on, so we can standardize that and make that a secure experience, a good experience for them. This is one of those cases where you know that there might be innovation. Cool. So you know, I, I have I read this. I've been reading this one thread that I got forwarded today, <laughs> um, where there are just some people really ripping on UAC. And again, I think it's based on on, on misperception and misunderstanding. Usually is. But how do you how do you guys how do you guys deal with that? I mean, look, what's your response oh, when you're how about like your family member, right? You're the mm -hmm. person who architected this. Yep. When your brother or sister or cousin or wh whoever calls you and you're like, "Dude, this sucks, man. How do I turn it off?" Uh, yeah. What do you say? In so in in the in those cases, sure, they actually they haven't. That, I mean, that's the thing, right? The okay. machine got it up and running, got them up and running, and they haven't seen a prompt. Excellent. Um, you know, in, in the case of my parents, I was sort of tempted by the idea of making them standard users mm -hmm. and then creating an admin account that was completely separate and where they didn't know the password, so they would have to call me to okay any of that, but <laughs> I, 
you know what, my parents, responsible people, and they yeah. know, you know, be very careful, mm -hmm. but they don't, I mean, they don't see any prompts. Okay, you great. Know, they don't try to do admin things on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. um, and once their set of applications were installed, I mean, you know, maybe they bump into a new ActiveX control that they need okay. from time to time. Um, but they, uh, for their day-to-day, -day, they don't yeah. actually see prompts. Um, now, there have been people internally, mm -hmm. right? So I mentioned that there were a couple of cases where people were doing a lot of, you know, admin file copy operations. And, and so we have actually identified a couple of spots where, you know, doing those copies through the shell uh, can be painful. And mm -hmm. so we're, we're sort of working with them to nail down the exact scenarios that they're trying to do, see if we can give them workarounds, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the meantime, and, and at the same time try to figure out what a what sort of the right experience would be for them um, and therefore the right thing for the shell to implement, right, or for us to implement inside the shell. Um, so typically, it's, it's kind of case by case. It's mm -hmm. finding out, you know, it's, yeah. it's, when you start off with, with someone who is yelling and screaming, first thing you have to do is kind of get them off the ledge mm -hmm. and then find out, you know, it's okay, give me the actual list, right? Give me the actual scenarios, the so. actual elevations you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually work from there to, to do something concrete. Um, there, there have been in a lot of cases, and like you were saying, like Chris was saying, people just yelling based on perceptions. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a lot of cases where you know people, you know, they yell, they've jumped on the bandwagon, and I say, well, which which ones are you hitting specifically? Right. They say, oh, well, I haven't installed the corporate image of Vista yet. I say, well, well why not? And, and what are you ranting about? They say, well, I just remember that back when I was using Beta two, I got prompted all the time. And everyone's yelling about these prompts all the time, and so I know that that's exactly yeah. what they're talking about. Absolutely. And I say, you know, why don't you actually try the released product <laughs> yeah. as opposed to the beta version, yeah. and, and then let us know, right? And if you're still getting hit with prompts all the time, then, then we want to know, and then we can do something about it. If it's something we already fixed and already took care of, yelling is not doing anybody any benefit. Absolutely. So, so a lot of people... Have We've changed how Windows works, and anytime you change how something works, people are generally, you know, sort of taken aback, and they have a reaction. And mm -hmm. we see that a lot. And, and there's two other things at play here. The first one is UAC prompts are most common when you're setting up your machine. Mm -hmm. So they got this brand new OS, they're all excited about it, and they go to configure, and perhaps they get a couple of UAC prompts, and we hear about it mm -hmm. time and time again. Yeah, sure. But what we see is, you know, within a couple of days, these prompts dramatically decrease. Um, and and it, there are some cases where some of our legacy apps are causing things to prompt, and we're dealing with those as fast as we can, too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like it's literally the birth of Vista, and we're going through this, and we're cleaning up as fast as we can, and we're getting the feedback, and we're doing everything we can do to make it work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, we, we are firmly committed to making it work. It's just it's interesting for us to watch just watch the whole thing evolve and Absolutely. understand our users and what they're going through. So. Excellent, man. Excellent. And again, I mean, Vista is a user-centric operating system. I yep. mean, UAC is user-centric. Yeah, it might throw people off a little bit, but the fact of the matter is the system saying, hey, yeah. I want to protect you. Yeah. Are you sure you want to do this? The, the intent is to keep users safe, not certainly not to, to punish or cause pain on users. Exactly. Um, Absolutely. And so, exactly. yeah, as, as we will probably say time and time again, right, if it is, we, we just need to know exactly how. Okay. and sort of what the end-to-end -end scenario is that you're walking through and, and why you're getting hit or for what you're getting hit with the prompts all the time and you know, from there we can actually do something. Excellent. So, so anyhow, let me, I guess, finish yeah, up on this. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so we get the elevation dialog up and at the end of the day either you hit OK or an admin enters credentials mm -hmm. and what we end up doing is inside of consent.exe we will go and generate an admin token. So I'll just say and that token handle gets passed back to the app info service. Okay. And so at that point, app info actually goes and it takes that token and it calls create process as user. Okay. And this time we actually go through those same three elevation checks, hmm. right? But we have an admin token. Uh -huh. And so they all pass. They say, yep, this requires elevation, and bingo, you have an elevated token. And so this actually then goes and pumps through the kernel, and it launches your admin exe on the user's desktop. Right? Now, there are other technologies in the box, um, mm -hmm. a bunch of them that I saw actually mentioned on, that, on the Channel 9 thread. 
things like uh, UIPI, user interface process isolation. Um, that kind of blocks window messages, or at least most window messages, from going traveling upwards from something less, uh, less privileged to higher privileged. Mm -hmm. um, it does allow some through. So for example, you know, if you like the fact that all of your applications show up in the taskbar at the bottom of the screen, if you like being able to alt tab between them, which most people pretty much do, mm -hmm. um, the messages that the shell sends to elevated applications, which are safe Windows messages, mm -hmm. right, we sort of went through them one by one and validated each one and its arguments, right, those are allowed through by default. Um, additionally, elevated applications, if they want, can opt in to receive more messages. They can basically say, yep, I am totally safe and secure when handling this set of messages. Please allow those through to me as well. Excellent. Um, and then another thing that we do that we introduced inside of Vista is this thing called mandatory integrity controls. Mm -hmm. And ultimately what we end up doing is for all of the stuff that's in, that's running as the user, right, this will have a label of, wow, that's completely illegible, medium. Right? Mm -hmm. And then this admin application will have a label of high. And what that does, right, is we actually block writing up and for the case, in the case of processes, reading up as well. Uh, and the reason we do that is, so remember what we have right now, we have these admins with sort of split tokens. Mm -hmm. right? You sort of have the, the, the little version or the standard user version of, of your token and then the elevated version of it as well. Ultimately, they both have the same user SID. And so technically speaking, right, well, since this process is running as you and that process is running as you, mm -hmm. without something that differentiates the two of them, which would be the integrity levels, mm -hmm. this process would be able to open that process and you know write all over its address space and do all kinds of fun things that are obviously very bad if you're trying to say that this is elevated and is at least relatively safe. Okay. Um, and so the integrity levels there essentially tell the system, no, 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 you know what? Explorer, the shell, it can't open that elevated process for write access. And that actually, it works in conjunction with the existing process DACL Right, all of the security mechanisms, the low-level security mechanisms that were already in the system. So even in you know the case of a cross-user scenario, that DACL comes into play um, in addition to the integrity level. And that technology is also what enables low rates, i.e., mandatory yes. integrity control. So that would have uh, that process would be more just low, and therefore mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to influence the other ones in the same ways John just mentioned. Yep. So. Fantastic. I mean, so the picture that you've painted here is that UAC is a heck of a lot more than UI. <laughs> and it's something yeah. I think that's critically important for people to understand. Yeah, it, it was, I mean, it, it was, it was a, uh, the, the largest change was obviously sort of the, the mindset and the mentality, right? That from now on, Windows and the Windows ecosystem are, are should be designed with the standard user in mind, right? That, that easily was the largest change. Um, as far as the architecture yeah. goes and, and the code, well, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, we're not talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of code that went into this. It's actually, you know, relatively lightweight, you know, a few lines of code here, new service there, mm -hmm. new executable, right? In, in, in the grand scheme of sort of, you know, small feature, features versus large features, it's somewhere in the middle as far as actual code goes. Mm -hmm. The ripple effects, however, are, are fairly substantial. So. Yeah, exactly. Well, great. I, I think it's great. I think it's going to help make Vista our most secure general purpose operating system to date. I mean, it's uh, certainly a significant advancement over XPSP2. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys should be proud of what you've done. And we should keep on, I mean, you should get on Channel 9. I know you're a busy guy, but you know, you could always pop on those threads and educate these people because yep. there's, there's full of misperception. And when the people who actually thought up the technology, and that's why we come and talk to you on Channel 9, because yep. you really know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't. Most of us don't. So, you know, this is great. This, you just explain to us how UAC works. And, of course, why Vista is going to be a very secure system. And there's other security constructs of Vista as well besides UAC. Oh, sure. And we talked to Scott Phil Field, mm -hmm. and he drew this really interesting diagram for us. And we talked about <laughs> the hardening of services and mm -hmm. an extensive amount of work that's gone in to make it a truly secure system. <laughs> Unfortunately, you guys are in the limelight right now. <laughs> yeah, we're because in the limelight. Your, your yeah. biggest mistake you made was exposing UI, man. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Well, great job, you guys. Appreciate it. I appreciate awesome. this. is an extensive amount of your time. So. And we'll talk to you again, all right? Maybe Sounds for like some future thing. Let's do it. <laughs> all right, take care.